Have you ever imagined the future? We know the answer because we have already done it. The constant development of technology and the progress that industry gives to the world let us see so far from our minds. Technologies are to satisfy our necessities, but nowadays they must look for renewable energy. The environment and its preservation are essential in modern human life. Industries give us different products and services. The metal industry makes humans what they are nowadays. One specific metal is essential because of its applications in edification, home appliances and transport. Have you already guessed what material we are referring to? Steel. Because of this material, we have created our lifestyle. For years, the steel industry has improved the clean energy sector. Let's take a look at it. Steel is the opportunity to produce energy, store it and distribute it. For example, geothermal energy which we obtain from the inner layers of the earth and, because of the temperature, let us generate water or steam and turn it into other kinds of energy, like electrical. Geothermal energy needs nickel stainless steel for building power stations. The steel properties allow us to use it in many ways. They are its thermal resistance and capacity to transport energy with the lowest possible losses. We can describe steel with just one word, efficient. Many industries have the principal purpose of reducing carbon emissions. The steel industry is not the exception because it is responsible for 7% of the CO2 emissions globally. One way of turning this industry into renewable is by decarbonization. In this process, we replace carbon with hydrogen and remove oxygen in iron mineral in electrolysis. This way, we avoid steel with CO2 emissions and attempt one that has a big recycling capacity. We can find still almost every single thing that we do every day. And uh, since steel is uh, highly recyclable, it's a very good option for when trying to, to, to improve the, the processes uh, in order to, to contribute to, to this uh, reduction. And the path is, is clear. It's going to be a, a hard you know, way, but uh, there's a lot of people working uh, in order to achieve these uh, goals. Steel is the tool that let us develop and improve technologies for the future, seeking environmental wellness and renewable processes. The Systems Group, family owned and taking care of our customers for over 50 years. Systems is 100% focused on the steel industry. Our divisions include systems plant services, providing steel mills with craft labor to maintain, repair, and keep your plant running. Systems contracting builds new steel mills and capital expansions. As a self-performing contractor, we install process piping, steel erection, and equipment setting. Systems spray cooled, providing melt shops around the world with a safer alternative to pressurized water cooling. Systems Fab and Machine, supplying your structural steel, plate work, custom steel, machining, and pipe fabrication needs. Systems Engineering provides in-house design for process piping and steel structures to ensure accurate fabrication and speedy installation for each project's unique requirements. And Systems Clean Air, to ensure clean air to all your critical spaces. The Systems Group, engineered solutions for a safer, more productive steel industry. All right, so we have much to accomplish this morning. We're going to look to start the program while you may be finishing up your breakfast, for which I would really love us to thank the Huntington Center staff for their service this morning. Please give all these hardworking people a nice round of applause. All right, so listen, I'm fond of that adage that 90% of one's success in life can be attributed to simply showing up. And so I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for making the effort to show up here this morning and for AIS Tech this week. AIS Tech is all about solving challenges through networking, education, and sustainability programs to make a better steel industry. And your showing up is what makes AIST so effective. Your presence is how we get things done, your presence is good for steel. And as I look out over this wonderful audience, 
If we're going to make this industry as safe as it can be, we need 100% of you to show up. And I'm going to look over here to the left of this dais to our, our board of directors and our association leadership. If we're going to make this industry as green as it can be, we need 100% of these people to show up. And if I'm going to look over here to the right of this dais to our award winners, our town hall panelists, and all those AIST past presidents, each of whom I've had the joy to work with at length, if we're going to make this industry as smart as it can be, we got to have at least 90% of this group show up for that. So. <laughs> When we make the effort to show up, we the people of steel, really, we can't be beat. We're unbeatable. Time and again, we've shown our collective resolve to rise above the challenges, to reform our conventional approach, and to relentlessly innovate our technology. What we do is really good for the world, and for that, we can all be proud. Over the last 150 years, the steel industry has helped build the modern world. And today, we have before us a very rare opportunity. In fact, it's a multi-generational opportunity to lead the world through the evolution of breakthrough technologies to a brighter, more sustainable future. The steel industry is advancing technologies that will leverage cleaner energy sources, such as natural gas, wind, solar, nuclear, and hydrogen, so we can achieve net zero atmospheric emissions within the next three decades. It's a path with no return. Climate neutral steel is the ultimate mission whereby we can leverage our collective industrial strength for the greater good of our world. And despite being fiercely competitive, there are three areas where the steel industry can and should work together to advance our cause. One, health and safety. Two, new markets. And three, workforce development. Decarbonization is a win for the health and safety of humanity and our planet. It's a win for creating new markets because clean energy needs steel, lots of it. And steel needs clean energy, lots of it. This fundamental interdependence is indeed a win for creating new markets for steel. And to be a leader for all of manufacturing, decarbonized steel will mandate that we become early adopters of smart technology, which is a win to attract our next generation workforce. It's a win, win, win. It's the trifecta for steel. It's ideally suited for industry-wide collaboration, and it's the perfect challenge for AIST members all around the world. Numerous climate-neutral steel technologies are on full display this week at AIS Tech because they align fully with AIST's mission to advance the technical development, production, processing, and application of iron and steel. AIST has always been proactive to leverage our programs with meaningful collaboration throughout the world as we reflect the business of the people, the companies that we're here to serve. Our programs disseminate knowledge. They strengthen the steel industry for the greater benefit of our members, for their employers, for the communities where we live, our reach includes thousands of members who participate on 29 diverse technology committees. They represent the world's largest network of technical expertise for steel manufacturing. In parallel, our 22 member chapters across six continents help maintain a regular AIST presence around the world. Networking and education are at the heart of our mission, and nothing exemplifies that effort better than our gathering here this week in Detroit for AIS Tech. As of last evening, almost 7,000 people have registered for AIS Tech 2023. We have nearly 1,300 people here this morning for our President's Award Breakfast, many others watching online. This year's conference includes 445 technical presentations representing over 1,100 authors from over 30 countries around the world. And the AIS Tech Exposition, it's always one of the largest in the world, includes 588 companies for an outstanding showcase of the latest technology for steel manufacturing. If you're with an exhibiting company, I want to ask you to please stand right now. So if you're a personnel from an exhibiting company, please stand. 
You know who you are. I want to take this opportunity to recognize this group, every company in the exhibit hall. It's all of you who showed up this week to support the steel industry, so much so that I'm very proud to announce that this year's exposition is the largest ever in the history of this organization. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to make a number of introductions at this point, and I ask that you please hold your applause until each group is introduced. So ladies and gentlemen on the dais, as you're introduced, would you please stand and, and remain standing? And we're going to start just left of the podium in the front row with our current officers. We have Steve Henderson, Commercial Metals Company, AIST immediate past president. Barry Schneider, Steel Dynamics. He's the AIST vice president and town hall panelist this year. Brian Bishop, Cleveland Cliffs, AIST second vice president. Tom Toner, SSAB Americas, AIST officer at large. Kevin Zeek, U.S. Steel, AIST officer at large, current AIME past president. John Spear, Colorado School Mines. He's an AIST officer at large. He's a distinguished member, AIME honorary member, and he's an AIME past president. Mark Fedor, Morgan Engineering. He's the AIST and the AIST Foundation treasurer. Also with us are Glenn Pushes, Steel Dynamics. He's the AIST Foundation president, the AIST past president. He's an AIME honorary member. Michelle Laurie Monroe, AIME executive director. Jennifer Miskimins, Colorado School of Mines and AIME president. Phil Bell, SMA president. And Kevin Dempsey, AISI president. Please give them a warm welcome today. <laughs> Next, the AIST board of directors who are with us today, <clears throat> starting on your left in the back row. We have Amy Beard, Quaker Houghton. Cliff Chapman, Cleveland Cliffs, Burns Harbor. Ian Deeks, Newcore Steel, Arkansas. Kyle Edwards, Arcelor Middle DeFasco. Carl Geringer, Steel Dynamics. Jim Hendrickson, Cleveland Cliffs, Burns Harbor. Becky Heights, Steel Insights. Palava Kaushik, Arcelor Middle Global Research and Development. Mark McGinley, Hall Industries, is an AIST Distinguished Member. Dave Nickel, XTech. Jose Noldeen, Gravity, Bill Schlichting, U.S. Steel, Grant Thomas, Cleveland Cliffs Research and Innovation Center, Chris Welfel, CMC Steel, Texas, and Zane Voss, Continuous Improvement Experts. This esteemed group has worked really hard over the past year to govern AIST. We owe them a debt of gratitude for their service to our association and to our industry. Thank you. Next, our honored guest, starting with those who have led us in previous years, our past presidents who are with us today. From 2018, Jim Dudek, formerly U.S. Steel, to AIST Foundation trustee. 2016, Wendell Carter, Cleveland Cliss, he's a distinguished member and an AIME honorary member. 2015, George Koenig, Hatch Associates, he's our town hall chair, he's an AIST distinguished member. 2013, Terry Fedor, Cleveland Cliffs, AIME honorary member, is foundation president-elect. In 2010, Bill Breedlove, Anchor Industries, the past foundation president, distinguished member, and AIME honorary member. 2006, Dick Teets, retired from Steel Dynamics, the distinguished member, and AIME honorary member. 2004, Tom Graham Jr., Hot Work USA. And from 2003, Bill Barker, he's an AIME honorary member. Please join me in thanking our past presidents. And our honored guests and award recipients. We have with us today Tracy Forrester, Cleveland Cliffs, town hall panelist. Sushma Walker from Nucor, town hall panelist. Mike Williams, Timken Steel, town hall panelist. Chad Cathcart from Stelco is the AIS Tech Conference Planning Committee Chair. And moving then to the front row, we have Brian Webler, Carnegie Mellon University, is an AIST Foundation Professor. Don Tu, Hatch. Patrick Hansert, Bodystall Engineering. Ian Cameron, Hatch. Ron O'Malley, Missouri University of Science and Technology. Ron's an AIST past president, 
is a distinguished member and an AIME honorary member. Ted Zenzimir, T. Zenzimir Company. Martin Pay, SSAB. Partition Valley, Coal Science Incorporated. Madhu Ranade, Steel Dynamics. Ted Lyon, Hatch. He's a foundation past president, he's a past AIST, AIST Foundation Treasurer, and AIME Honorary Member. Bill Emling, retired from the SMS Group. Jimmy Barrett, Allied Mineral Products. Leon Topoli and Nucor. Our keynote speaker is John Brett, ArcelorMittal North America. And the AIST president, Keith Howe, ArcelorMittal North America. Please welcome them. Next, I want to ask all the authors and session chairs for the AIS conference this week that are here in the audience to please stand. So these are our authors and session chairs. I know you're out there. Please do stand. On behalf of the board of directors, we want to acknowledge the significant contribution of these people in the fulfillment of our mission. Your efforts represent true innovation in steel. Thank you. I also want to extend a very sincere thank you to our many officers and volunteers here today representing our member chapters, our technology committees, for your valuable contributions to the fulfillment of our mission. We also recognize the AIST Foundation trustees, our AIME trustees, and our AIST distinguished members. Your enduring efforts to proudly carry AIST banners throughout the world are appreciated. And a sincere thank you to our sponsor, the Systems Group for underwriting our breakfast program, to our steel producers, our industry suppliers, steel academia, we thank you all for your support. Working in the steel industry is an incredibly satisfying profession, but as we all know, it demands much in return, long hours, significant travel away from home, a constant tether to the tyranny of the urgent, and without the support of our families, we cannot do what we do. And so on behalf of the steel industry, I want to share this sentiment with all family members of the steel community who are in attendance today. Thank you for your support. So now, please join me in welcoming to the podium AIST President Keith Howe. Thank you, Ron, and good morning, everyone. I want to thank the AIST membership for the opportunity to serve as your president this past year. It is remarkable to consider the world as it existed at the end of 2019 and, it, and how much different it has become today, a mere three years ago. Where there was once abundance, there is scarcity, and where there was peace, there is now war. These are indeed uncertain times, and considering the moment, it reminded uh, me of uh, President John Kennedy's famous moonshot speech in 1962. We meet in an hour of challenge and change, a decade of hope and fear, an age of both knowledge and ignorance. Those were the opening words in his argument to the nation as to why it should endeavor to go to the moon. I think it's fitting to recall his speech as 60 years later we find ourselves in another great race, the race to decarbonize society. But whereas Kennedy spoke to the question, should we? We find ourselves asking, can we? Some, some will say the answer is elusive, that steel is at best difficult to abate. Difficult, yes, but impossible, no. If ever there was a group of people more equipped, more capable, and more suited to realizing our decarbonization goals than it is the people assembled here in this very room. I come from a family of steelmakers and have spent my career surrounded by those who make steel. So I say this with some authority. You will not find a more clever, inventive, and hardworking bunch of problem solvers than the men and women of this industry. Decarbonization is indeed achievable. Certainly we have the talent, but we have the will too. And should you need convinced, look no further than the AIS Tech Conference agenda. As an educational exercise, I ask you to count the number of times words such as decarbonization, green steel, and sustainability appear. It's a big number. Of course, money talks too, often louder than words. So if you need further evidence, then look at the billions of dollars this industry, my company included, is investing in new plants and equipment to ensure we achieve our emission goals. 
Decarbonization is the moonshot of our time. And while it is a great challenge, it is also a great opportunity. An opportunity to lead all of industry and to demonstrate what can be achieved when innovation, perseverance, and technology are brought to bear on modern day problems. Whereas in 1962, Kennedy had to persuade a skeptical America of the necessity of sending man to the moon, no such convincing is needed now. Society is already demanding decarbonization, and failure to deliver it is arguably immoral and perhaps unconscionable, not to mention bad business. Our customers are demanding clean and sustainably produced steels because their customers are demanding clean and sustainably produced products. Moreover, trade and climate policy appear to be merging, and in a not too distant future, it seems access to foreign markets will be conditioned upon how cleanly you can produce a product. The work ahead will not be easy, nor will it be inexpensive. But as Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. Climate change is a global problem that necessitates global solutions. And the only way for humanity to win is through cooperation and collaboration, both hallmarks of AIST, which has been promoting the dissemination of knowledge for the greater good of the steel industry for more than 150 years. For steel production, there is no single road to reach carbon neutrality, and there is no single technology that will convey us to that end. It will take a variety of solutions, utilizing a variety of technologies, many of which need further commercial development. To this end, AIST received a grant last September from the U.S. Department of Commerce to compile a technology roadmap for iron and steel manufacturing. The project runs through May 2024, will identify and prioritize research projects to address technologies, infrastructure, and workforce needs to advance manufacturing competitiveness across the steel industry value chain. We are utilizing numerous AIST workshops to facilitate the road mapping effort, which includes four technological areas, carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, use of low and no carbon fuels, electrification of thermal processes, and material and energy optimization via smart manufacturing. The work is well underway, and I wish to thank AIST's Dr. Alicia Goffin for her, for her instrumental role spearheading this effort. AIST has also been working with U.S. Departments of Energy and Commerce to identify public-private partnerships to advance breakthrough clean steel technologies, including those related to hydrogen hubs being planned throughout this country. These efforts will require an infrastructure that will connect our industry's needs with the unique skill sets of our research institutions and national labs, all carried out with a coordinated strategy to achieve meaningful gains in energy conservation, decarbonization, and material efficiency. To get it done, we need steel producers, technology suppliers, research academia, and national labs working in concert and in collaboration with the iron American Iron and Steel Institute and Steel Manufacturers Association. To SMA President Phil Bell and AISI President Kevin Dempsey, I extend our gratitude for your efforts to collaborate with AIST on the, these efforts for technology advancement and to represent North America's producers with policy decisions in Washington and around the world. To emphasize the importance of leadership and strategic vision for steel, AIST has partnered with World Steel Dynamics to create the Global Steel Dynamics Forum with its premier event next month in New York City. This CEO event, continuing the tradition of the steel success strategies, is intended to catalyze the steel industry to be a leader for all of manufacturing by articulating strategies for productivity, green, digital, and workforce, each of which is rooted in technology and culture. The event is oriented to attract a diverse audience, including investment bankers, management consultants, analysts, technology services, and leaders from the steel supply chain, including transportation and service centers. I'd like to thank Phil Englund and his team at World Steel Dynamics for their partnership with this program. To take a full advantage of these significant opportunities for steel, we need AIST to be at the top of its game. In this regard, the pandemic may have knocked us down 
but it could never knock us out. We are back on our steel horse, and I'm proud to report the state of the association is strong. While the pandemic didn't undermine our membership count, we are firmly back in growth mode, having ended 2022 with 16,643 members, representing a 15.5% year-on-year growth rate. Our young professional membership, those 30 years of age and younger, is up 13.8%, and our female membership is up 24.3%, all representing impre impressive gains as we build back better. At our current growth rate, the all-time membership record set in 2019 is within reach by the end of the year, and I encourage you to help us make it happen. As we all know, workforce development is a priority for every company today. In a study by Headwall Partners released just last month, 68% of metals industry leaders cited workforce availability as the greatest risk to the financial performance of their business, a percentage that was much higher than any other risk, including war, inflation, raw material availability, and energy costs. AIST is well positioned to help with our 29 technology committees. Collectively, these committees comprise 4,000 members representing the world's most robust and diversified network of steel manufacturing expertise. These committees program numerous training courses with curriculum specific to steel. New courses introduced this year include electrical engineering fundamentals, managing, managing projects 101, and cold rolling 201. Each year this curriculum helps advance our education and improve company performance. I want to acknowledge Mark Zip of SMS Group for his efforts with our advanced cold rolling course. These courses put us one step closer to an informed, educated, and knowledgeable workforce, a workforce that will help steel succeed. On a related note, AISC held its first ever technology committee meeting in, in Europe last September when the Oxygen Steelmaking Committee met at Dillinger Hutenberg in Germany. The meeting focused on safety procedures for scrap handling and the recycling of steel in the converter. We appreciate the support of many oxygen steel producers from Europe and America who participated as we expand our geographical reach for meaningful technical exchange in this area of global decarbonization. Our sincere gratitude to Dominic Schaun, who is Vice Chair of the Oxygen Steelmaking Committee and the Melt Shop Manager at Dillinger. In the same vein, I wish to thank Giacomo Moreschi Danielli for his company's support of a very successful AIST European Steel Forum held last October in Italy. To build a better future for steel, we must endeavor to engage a younger and more diverse workforce. In this regard, I would like to thank Rachel Schmidt of Hydro and Alec Englund of Tokai Carbon, two of AIST's finest young professional members for their efforts to build relevant and quality program to, to provide opportunities for advancement. With programs such as Young Professional to Young Leader, preparing for the next step, we are building a strong foundation that will serve the steel industry well in the years ahead. The roundtable here in Detroit on Sunday focused on networking and actionable ideas on mentorship, professional development, and communication steel skills. I also want to thank Barry Schneider of Steel Dynamics, who joined the roundtable to share his career path advice for our young professional attendees. AIST continues to expand our Women in Steel programming, with its roundtable also held now annually at AIS Tech. This effort is to promote a diversified workforce for steel and to remove the barriers to entry for many prospective AIST members, which can transcend the association and have a positive impact on the industry overall. Since this work began just a few years ago, AIST's member, female membership has doubled from about 5% to now 10% of our professional membership. We still have a lot of work to do, but we can be proud of what we have accomplished. I'm also pleased to announce our first Women in Steel conference will take place in this September in Pittsburgh. This program is unique and specifically designed to support the recruitment, engagement, and professional development of women in the global steel industry. We anticipate more than 200 professionals will attend from operators to human resource personnel representing individuals at various stages of their careers. All are welcome and encouraged to join AIST for this unique and inclusive conference. As we take stock of all that is going on today, I believe there has never been a more exciting time to be in the steel industry. 
To see the path ahead clearly, one must also be a student of history. And it seems appropriate to acknowledge AIME in this context. Representing 200,000 members worldwide, the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical, and Petroleum Engineers, and its four member societies, AIST, SME, SPE, and TMS, have a united heritage of service to the diverse engineering professions within the mining, metallurgical, and petroleum industries since its founding in 1871. As a member of society, AIST applauds the longevity of AIME and will continue to support its future ambition to improve the engineering professions and quality of life for all. I wish to thank AIME immediate past president, Kevin Zeke, for his commitment to represent AIST with strength and compassion. And I also wish to acknowledge the retiring AIME executive director, Michelle Lowry Monroe, for her years of service and leadership. AIME is better today because of the dedicated service of these two individuals. I also welcome the new AIME staff under the tutelage of John Eric. On behalf of the AIST membership, we wish you well in the years ahead. In closing, AIST must continue to be strong and stable as we forge our vision to be a global leader in networking, education, and sustainability for advancing iron and steel technology. I challenge each of you to be an ambassador for steel, to help steel, to help society understand that steel is not a commodity, but an innovative engineer material that will enable the planet to thrive for generations to come. Help us bring meaningful change to society's perception about steel and the value it brings to every living soul on the planet. Finally, I wish to emphasize how much I enjoy meeting many of you throughout my chapter visits over this past year. Steel is phenomenal business because the people make it so. And while my tenure as AIST president will end at the conclusion of the conference, I'm confident that my successor, Barry Schneider of Steel Dynamics, will provide strong leadership for AIST as the organization continues to advance steel manufacturing technology. It's been an honor and privilege to serve AIST as your president. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to introduce Glenn Pushes of Steel Dynamics, president of the AIST Foundation. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone. The mission of the AIST Foundation is to ensure the iron and steel industry of tomorrow will have a sufficient number of qualified professionals. To fulfill this mission, we provide scholarships and internships to interested students and a variety of grants to teaching professionals. In 2005, not all that long ago, the foundation awarded $280,000 in annual support for the steel industry. I'm proud to tell you that in the current academic year, we will award in excess of a million dollars for the first time in our history. We are truly grateful to the steel industry and for all donors who have supported the AIST Foundation's efforts through the years, including the golfers and sponsors who came out this past Sunday to raise over $30,000. Thank you. I would also like to recognize the members of the $200,000 Pledge Club, which includes Cleveland Cliffs, Nucor, Steel Dynamics, and U.S. Steel. And while these may be the big guns, the Foundation is thriving today because of its industry-wide support uh, and appeal a broad base of support from many companies represented here this morning. So on behalf of the Foundation Board, thank you for your generous support. This year, our scholarship program awarded a record 44 steel intern scholarships. Those scholarships were $7,500 each. These scholarships include a paid internship at a steel-related company. And our goal next year is to award 50. About 67% of steel intern scholarship recipients go on to accept full-time employment in the steel industry, which is a very good conversion rate. And the numbers are getting better each year as we improve the quality of our collective internship programs. For our teaching professionals, we have nearly 20 unique grants for curriculum development, research, and encouraging junior faculty. And we recently added two new grants, including the Digital Technologies for Steel Manufacturing Grant and the Sustainable Technologies for Steel Manufacturing Grant these were each valued at $30,000 per year. 
For most of our grants, we provide an industry mentor to connect our companies with these schools to ensure we are working to solve meaningful, real-world challenges. The objective for each of these grants is threefold. To increase the number of teachers interested in steel, to increase the number of students studying a steel-related curriculum, and to recruit more students for employment in steel. Through our partnership in the Material Advantage Student Program with ACERS, ASM, and TMS, we now have the ability to reach over 4,000 university engineering students every single year. Our Steel to Students program grows every year, and we encourage you to get involved. The foundation is currently in a matching funds challenge, whereby all donations are being matched to an aggregate of $500,000. For us to continue what we need to do, we need your financial support. I ask you your, for your help today and encourage your company to make a multi-year pledge to the IST Foundation before the end of June. Your, philanth your philanthropy right now is very important and we need to act now. I would like to conclude my message today by asking all current and past trustees with us today from, for the AISD Foundation to please stand and be recognized. So all current and past trustees, if you could please stand up. You know, this is, a, this is the group of working board members who really gave their time to improve the future of our industry. On behalf of all AIST Foundation trustees, both past and present, we are pleased to have such tremendous support to fulfill our mission of service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. The Association for Iron and Steel Technology acknowledges technical excellence by recognizing through peer review the active leadership and significant contributions of individuals or companies to AIST and the global iron and steel industry. AIST has an extensive awards program and this morning we will be recognizing recipients for eight of our Board of Director awards. Our first award is the Hunt Kelly Outstanding Paper Award AIME. Established in 2004, this award represents the best technical paper published by the association during the previous year. Through funds endowed by AIME, this award includes a cash prize of $5,000 for first place, $2,500 for second place, and $1,000 for third place. This year's first place recipients are Justin Novotny, Ryan Junkin, Michael Mayhall, Jake Franks, and Phil Baker from Nucor Steel Tuscaloosa, and Patrick Hansert and Fatih Goksi from Badish Stahl Engineering. The second place recipients are Ian Cameron, John Tu, Mitran Sukram, and Jennifer Wolishan from Hatch. And the third place recipients are Mohammed Abdul Salam, Michael Jacobs, and Brian Webler from Carnegie Mellon University. On behalf of your fellow authors, I now ask Patrick Hansert, John Tu, and Brian Webler to join me at the podium. The, the first place paper is entitled Implementation of the Tillable Sidewall Burner at Nucor Steel Tuscaloosa, Dynamically Adjustable Burner Angle to Optimize Scrap Melting and Reduce Refractory Wear. The second place paper is entitled Addition of Scrap and DRI HBI to the Blast Furnace, Technology to Overcome Top Temperature Limits and Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions. And the third place paper is entitled Analysis of Inclusion Clusters using machine learning tools. The Benjamin F. Fairless Award for Distinguished Achievement in Iron and Steel Metallurgy was established by AIME in 1954 in honor of the former chairman of U.S. Steel for his intense interest in the technology and development of the iron and steel industry and to recognize distinguished achievement in iron and steel production and ferrous metallurgy. The 2023 recipient is Ian Cameron. Ian, would you please join me at the podium? The award reads, 
For his contributions to the ironmaking industry spanning more than four decades, Cameron is recognized as a global authority on ironmaking technologies and practices and is co-author of Blast Furnace Ironmaking, Analysis, Control, and Optimization, one of the most comprehensive modern publications dedicated to the art and science of ironmaking. An avid teacher and mentor to the next generation of ironmaking technologists, Cameron passionately serves AIST's mission to advance technology for iron, steel, and ferrous metallurgy. Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, President Howell, and it's a great honor to be here. Very big surprise. So um, three events happened in 1981 that led to me being here today. And the first was uh, most important is I married the love of my life, Judith, who's with us today. Great honor for me. The second was I finished my master's degree in uh, metallurgy at McGill under the tutelage of Professor Guthrie, who's also here today. So another great pleasure. Thank you, Rod. And uh, thirdly, I joined the ISS, the, one of the foundation, founding uh, groups for AIST. Fast forward to uh, 1996, and another important change happened, that after working for 15 years for producers, I decided to join Hogovens Technical Services and begin a career as a technical consultant. And it really was an area for me for great professional growth. So I haven't changed jobs since, but the company got sold twice, and I joined the Hatch family in 2001. And uh, that really su supercharged this professional growth. And I, my family got to live in Australia for three years. It was a great experience. So many of you who know me know that I'm somewhat soft-spoken. So today I'd like to say a very loud thank you to Ted Lyon for nominating me, uh, to the endorsers, uh, uh, Brad True from Nucor, uh, Jim Dudak from US Steel, um, John Quancy from Suncoke Energy, uh, Stephen Montague from Midrex Technologies, Professor Brian Thomas from the Colorado School of Mines and George Koenig from Hatch. I'd also like to say a second big thank you to Judith, my wife. She's been supporting me since uh, our school days at the McGill University. I'd also like to acknowledge Ann Kirkpatrick. Ann is here today as well. Ann has been a colleague of mine for uh, 20 years and she's really helped me to form the great team that we have at Hatch and really pull together a strong, strong group. So lastly, I'd like to thank the three C's. You're all in the audience, and these are my clients who've uh, put trust in me over the years, the collaborators who've helped me to find and solve difficult problems, and my colleagues who've been great team members to make this thing happen. So thank you very much. Great job. Great job. Next is the John F. Elliott Lectureship Award. This award was established in 1990 to honor Professor Elliott of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Through a series of university lectures, the award is conferred to acquaint students and engineers with the exciting opportunities in chemical process metallurgy and materials chemistry. This year's recipient is Antoine Eleanor. The award reads, in recognition of his distinguished contributions in sustainable chemical metallurgy, and green chemistry for the iron and steel industry and beyond. Eleanor's bold, inventive work lies at the intersection of cutting edge research and practical application for solving impactful problems, such as sustainability of metals production and green electrification. His groundbreaking efforts in the field of metals will be of adamant importance in the transition to a new era of steelmaking. Antoine could not be with us this morning, but I am pleased to accept this award on his behalf. The Howe Memorial Lecture Award was established in 1923 in memory of Professor Henry Marion Howe, one of the principal founders of modern day ferrous metallurgy. The award is presented every other year in recognition of outstanding contributions to the science and practice of iron and steel metallurgy or metallography. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the Howe Lecture. Over the last century, this association has welcomed 89 of the best and brightest minds in our industry to the conference stage to share their insights. We welcome the prestigious group of past lecturers to join us in Detroit this year as we celebrate this her the heritage and legacy of this award. 
On this 100th anniversary, I would like to take this moment to recognize several past Howe lecturers who are with us in the audience today, including Emmy Toshi, Jakob Gordon, Brian Thomas, and Roderick Guthrie. Gentlemen, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. The extraordinary work of how lecturers past and present has shaped our modern understanding of steelmaking as a science, and their work will undoubtedly inspire more innovation in the future. The 2023 recipient is Ron O'Malley, Missouri University of Science and Technology. Ron, would you please come to the podium? Dr. O'Malley's lecture, as presented yesterday, was entitled Fiber Optic Sensing Technology Supporting Advancements in Steel Production and the Shift to Industry 4.0. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Sure. So I just want to say it's been an honor to be able to give the 100th anniversary of Howe Memorial Lecture. And I want to just acknowledge a few people that were involved in the uh, generation of this uh, presentation and to make it possible. And first and foremost, the uh, team at Missouri S&T that I've worked with in a multi multidisciplinary department uh, arrangement where we've incorporated both the electrical engineering and the material science groups to actually work together to make these things work in the real world. It's uh, I want to acknowledge people like um, Ji Huang at uh, Missouri S&T, for example, for making this possible. My students and his students who work tirelessly, sometimes in the steel plants at all hours of the day, to try to make this happen. So I also want to thank the members of the uh, AIST uh, committee that nominated me, and want to thank the members of our steel center for their support to actually seed a lot of these programs that has made this possible. So with that, and thank you for my wife who is in the audience as well, so for letting me spend all this time to do this work. So thanks. To present our next award, please welcome to the podium Mr. Thaddeus Sensimir, President and CEO of T. Sensimir Incorporated. Thank you, Keith. The Thaddeus Sensimir uh, Memorial Medal for Innovation in Steel Manufacturing Technology was established in 1990 in memory of my grandfather's achievements and engineering contributions in developing process equipment for the steel industry. The award is presented in recognition of an individual who has advanced steel making through the invention, development, or application of new manufacturing processes or equipment. This year's recipient is Martin Pay from SSAB in Sweden. Martin, would you please join me here at the podium? The award reads, for his instrumental role in promoting the development of hydrogen breakthrough iron making technology, or hybrid, an innovative and transformative process for reducing iron ore using green hydrogen. Mr. Pei has guided the hybrid initiative from the laboratory to a successful pilot pilot steel industry, a commercially viable path towards decarbonization. As steel makers increasingly invest in hydrogen DRI technology, it is apparent that Pei's visionary work is defining the future of sustainable steel making. Thank you very much. It's a, a great honor to receive this award. I'm uh, extremely grateful 
uh, through ARST. As we all know, steel has been made for thousands of years. It is a fantastic material. It's, where it's strong, it's possible to recycle again and again. And we know that the demand is going to increase in the future. However, steel making from iron ore has been associated with massive greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a problem we need to solve, and solve it quickly, because climate cannot wait. SSAB has been working very long and be a climate front runner. Our blood furnaces in Sweden and Finland are among the most efficient ones in the world. But what we have done so far is not enough. We needed to attack the root cause of the emissions. Using hydrogen gas as, instead of coal as a reducing agent for iron making, this was studied already during the 1950s. However, it was first in 2015 during the negotiations which led to the Paris Agreement that we felt that time was right to launch a significant serious development program. In 2016, together with our partners, LKB and Vattenfall, we took the first steps towards creating something that our industry believed possible but never succeeded to make it at scale before. Steel produced with hydrogen reduced iron from mining to final steel products, fossil free steel. Since 2001, we have been able to make fossil free steel and deliver this to our selected customers. For this, I am grateful and proud. Thank you very much for this recognition. On behalf of my colleagues and partners, uh, great thanks to all, all of you today. We are still in the beginning of our journey towards fossil free steel. Thank you. The Distinguished Member and Fellow Award was established in 1975 and is awarded to an AIST member who has attained eminent distinction in, in advancing the technical development, production, processing, and application of iron and steel, and has performed meritorious service to the association. There are five recipients this year. First will be Hardishan Valio from Coal Science Incorporated. Hardishan, would you please join me at the podium? The award reads, in recognition of his tireless work to advance the understanding and practical application of metallurgical coal science worldwide. An award-winning researcher and author of more than 100 papers and publications, Valia has remained devoted to sharing his incomparable technical insight with others as a lecturer, technical session chair, and technology committee member. Through teaching and mentoring the next generation of engineers, Valia embodies the spirit of AIST's educational mission. Congratulations. Good morning. Namaste. Wow, what a journey it has been. From my nascent years of medical journey, looking at the magnificent, colorful carbon forms during the process of coal to coke transformation, and you wonder at what Mother Nature gives you such amazing, wonderful, magical things, you have to fall in love when you see these two things. Coal under the microscope and coke 
Aha. Two. Simple. When an untrained person sees a coal and coke, what does he think of? It's a dark color, dirty looking material. Uh, wait a minute. <clears throat> when you look under the microscope, you see how the organic entities in coal on the left melt forming a pneumatic liquid crystal. Pneumatic, not the liquid crystal, pneumatic like. They come closer, talk to each other, fall in love, and then coalesce. And give rise to a colorful entity called coke, which you see on the, on the other side. Now, this has to go you. You have to fall in love, and it is this interaction, exciting interaction with science that I have followed and pursued at Indian Steel, which is now Arsene Vikram, where I got full cooperation from co-workers, from my beloved technicians, without whom probably I would not be here at all, and my supervisors and my executors. Now I must acknowledge the coal photographers from the academia and from the industry, from domestic and from international arena who have done path-breaking research, which the fruits we all are enjoying today. Now, during my early years at Illness Steel, I'm sorry, I have a hard time now, changing from Illness Steel to Arsenal. So, because I spent most of my life there, you know, in the early part. So, I was given the advice to join R Steel Society, which is now AST, to enhance my professional growth. What a precious gift I was offered. AIST opened up a whole world of giants of coke making, iron making, and steel making, who were more than willing to offer their wisdom and to help me through various pathways. And last year, oh, one more thing, sorry, one more thing. Uh, AIST, uh, I am grateful to AIST for <coughs> contributing to the person that I am today. And lastly, sweet dreams are easily, easily attainable if you have support of the family. So I am thankful to my wife Bhupinder, to my son Vikram, and to my daughter Anu. And one more last thing, and that is my mantra to the young generation, young generations of steel makers. Follow your passion passionately and all good things will come to you. Thank you. Our second recipient is Madhu Ranade from Steel Dynamics. Madhu, would you please join me at the podium? In recognition of his distinguished career in the steel industry, his 40 plus years of technical contributions and his exceptional leadership of integrated and mini mill operations. Throughout his career, Ronade has cultivated a unique blend of business acumen, technology expertise, dedication, and tactical skills that has translated to successful, safe, and efficient plant operations. His enthusiastic support of AIST conferences, technology committees, and training programs has inspired his colleagues and fellow AIS team members. Congratulations. Thank you. To be recognized by the peers is one of the best things 
anybody can ask, especially in our industry. And so that makes today my, one of my happiest day in my life. So thank you, AIST Awards and Program Recognition Committee, as well as AIST Board of Directors. And I do want to uh, uh, also thank the people who nominated me, uh, Kamalesh Mandal, who I have had the pleasure of working with for the last 10 years, uh, Trevor Shellhammer, uh, that goes back to my AISI Iron Making Committee days. Uh, Joe Poromo, we go back almost 30 years working on iron ore pellets and uh, research in that area. Uh, Don Zuki, uh, again, one of the first engineers I came across in iron making uh, when I started my career. Uh, Wendell Carter, who is uh, here, we have worked on, I think, a number of projects and in various different roles, we have worked together for more than 30 years. And uh, Dale Hines, I think he's here too. Uh, we worked together at Burns Harbor for uh, more than seven years. Uh, it was a fun time. And also uh, Barry Schneider, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working for now for uh, nine years. So certainly, thank you to all those that have nominated me. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to Darshan Walia, actually, one of the winners of today. Uh, I have relied on him uh, all the way till 2013 uh, on his expertise in uh, coal science. Uh, just going forward, you know, I mean, uh, there was a small company called Inland Steel, as he mentioned, and it's kind of nice to have two people who started their career at about the same time be recognized by AIST at the same time. So that, that is great. Um, my career in steel industry has been a dream, and I'm still living that dream. Uh, how many people get a chance to run two major integrated steel plants and then get a chance to run a modern, uh, minimal, and uh, also really live the minimal culture? And I've been doing that for the past 10 years thoroughly enjoying it. So it's, I'm really a lucky person uh, from that perspective. So and finally, I would like to thank my uh, colleagues at Indiana Harbor, at Burns Harbor, in uh, Columbus, Mississippi, and Steel Dynamics for the support that they have provided me throughout, that, throughout my career. So thank you very much. Our third recipient is Ted Lyon from Hatch. Ted, would you please join me at the podium? The award reads, in recognition of his leadership and commitment to AIST, the AIST Foundation, and the global steel industry. Lyon has served in executive and board roles with the Iron and Steel Society and later AIST, and was instrumental to AIST's evolution and success. During his tenure as AIST Foundation President, Lyon oversaw significant fundraising efforts and bolstered scholarship and grant programs dedicated to providing the steel industry of tomorrow with passionate, qualified professionals. And as a trusted advisor on industry trends and developments, Lyon continues to support the strategic growth of AIST into the future. Congratulations. Thanks, Keith. Uh, very much appreciate that. Um, by a show of hands in the room here, uh, is anybody familiar with the movie A Christmas Story? Raise your hands. Uh, yeah, okay. So, it, well, if you do, and if you know the movie, you'll know what I mean when I tell you that this is a major award. Right? So, anyhow. And for, for those of you who know the movie and know me well, you can shoot your eye out with a BB gun also. Anyhow. Uh, I digress. And thanks, Ron, for giving me 25 minutes. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, a, mi yeah. a minute and 33 seconds is what I was told I can have here. Ron runs a tight ship. Anyhow, uh, as I stand here and reflect, it's hard uh, to believe that I've been a member 
the ISS, AISE, and now the successor organization, the AIST, for over 30 years. Uh, I'd like to thank those that nominated and endorsed my nomination for this award. As I shared with that group, it is really special to be nominated for a prestigious award like this by your colleagues and peers. One doesn't stick with an organization for 30 years without a compelling reason. What compels me has been the valuable mission and good work of the organization and the professional and personal relationships that I've established with the best minds and talents in the business. Likewise, I've been working with Hatch Associates for 20 years. Hatch has provided me a unique and unparalleled platform to advance my career, practice my vocation as an engineer, and all in an environment of innovation and positive change. Thanks to Hatch, and a shout out to 30 or so Hatch colleagues here in the room with us today. I couldn't imagine a more talented, innovative, and inclusive group to work with. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my wife, Joanne, who's sitting right in front of me here, uh, while I embarrass her in front of 1,300 people. Thank you for, for being at my side for the last 43 years, providing support, encouragement, and advice without which I wouldn't be standing here this morning. Finally, thanks to everybody in the room, 1,300 people that make a difference to this industry every day. I have had the opportunity to watch the development of AIST from its inception, and I can say unequivocally that this organization has never been more relevant to the development and success of the iron and steel industry. Take advantage of it. The future looks bright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our fourth recipient is Bill Emling, retired from SMS Group. Bill, would you please join me at the podium? The award reads, in recognition of his distinguished service to the iron and steel industry, both as a producer and a supplier, and for his enduring commitment to AIST. Emling has dedicated his career to the advancement of steelmaking and continuous casting technologies, and to encouraging an environment for lifelong learning among his peers and colleagues. As an instructor for the Continuous Casting Technology Committee, he has shared his knowledge and enthusiasm for the industry and its innovations, while his years of association leadership exemplify his devotion to AIST and its predecessor. With his technical expertise, consummate professionalism, and passion for mentorship, Emling represents the finest qualities of our industry. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, wow, this award really means a lot to me. Um, I'll be short. Uh, I wanted to thank Lou Valentis, who nominated me, and all the people who uh, supported the nomination and the board of directors for voting for me. Um, a special shout out to Ron and the staff, who do a tremendous job. Um, like to thank my family, my wife Jean, and my daughter Jennifer are in the front, excuse me, <laughs> in the front row, my, my son Brian and Patrick, and my grandson Charlie are watching uh, attentively online. Um, I'd like to thank my employer, SMS Group. I was very proud to work many years there, and uh, I wanted to thank both SMS and all of the customers that we worked with uh, to make safety, productivity, and sustainability improvements. Um, thank you all very much. Our final recipient is James Barrett of Allied Minerals Products. Jimmy, would you please join me at the podium? The award reads, in recognition of his leadership and dedication to furthering the mission of AIST, an expert in steelmaking refractories with four decades of experience. Barrett was instrumental in founding the AIST Secondary Steelmaking and Refractories Technology Training Conference, and his resourcefulness endured the continued success of this program even during COVID-19 pandemic. 
Time and again, Barrett has lent his support to the association and his fellow members as an educator and mentor, encouraging and motivating the next generation of steelmaking and refractory engineers. Congratulations. Wow, good morning, everybody. I gotta say one thing. In 1969, I was in high school, and I actually was working in the stir plant, three to 11 and 11 to sevens. And I finished, my edu uh, I finished high school, and I never thought from being in the stir industry, in the blast furnace, and black one, and a labor gang. Out of the labor gang, actually sitting, looking for a job. And I, after that, uh, life really hit good. I ended up going into the United States Air Force, had a four years great education, came out, worked full time, and got my degree. Uh, life is good. So Lackawanna, hats off to you. Um, I'm very humble for this award. I really appreciate it. I thank the board, uh, Rakesh Dukas from U.S. there, who put me in, and all the other members. Um, next, I want a big thank you, great, for the staff of AIST. Thank you very much, Ron. You have a great staff in that. I want just but bring out Brian, Anna, Shannon, and Jessica, and there's so many others. You, you, you are a, 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 a great team, machine. Now, I want to make special thanks to some of my colleagues that, that was in the, um, well, I worked 43 years burning the place down, blast furnace, whatever I did, it seemed like I learned from my mistakes. As a dumb country boy, I found out one guy, old man, told me, if you make a mistake, make it once, Mr. Barrett, because if not, you're not going to be working in the steering the street. So I learned that. So I want to give a heads up, a thank you for Tom Rooser, Rick Fash, Mike Panzeri, Steve Ressler, and Fred Work. They, they actually helped me in the steering industry learn and learn from my mistakes and all the other people in the steering industry. Now, a special shout out for Allied Mineral Products and Allied Mineral Technical Service. We're an employee-owned company, and they have supported my work at the AIST. They have generously given me time and a budget, which is very important in life, uh, for my AIST duties. I want to thank Paul Jameson, Floris Van Laura, Jim McMahon, and Angela Pepicelli, and the whole team. They really helped me out. Now, nobody can be up here successful without a, a beautiful, nice wife. My wife and I have been married 45 years, and the, la the first 20 years, I worked shift work, you know, all around the clock. And I, so I worked three out of four Sundays, and the other Sunday, I was at the air guard work. And so uh, thank you very much, Carolyn. I really appreciate it. And I want to leave with one thing, which is probably more important, because I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm a dunk country boy teacher. Five years and four days ago, I rang a bell, and that bell was really important to me because I had have to had 40 treatments of radiation, and I wanted to make the AST so bad that a couple of times they had power failures, and I had to go back that afternoon. I told my wife I had to make these 40 treatments of radiation so I could make the AST. I finished up my radiation on Friday, Sunday, I was at the AIST in Philadelphia. So one of my, the messages I want to take, there's a lot of men out there on boys, and I'll tell you what, one out of every six men will have prostate cancer sometime in their lives. So you look around and get your PSA checked every year. I don't care how, you, how young you are, what it is, it's just a blood test, PSA, and you get a benchmark, if you have cancer, which a lot of every men in here, there'll be a very good chance you have it. Just take care of yourselves. And, you, and the young ladies and young women, take care of your professional house too. Thank you all. Jimmy. Jimmy. The Steelmaker of the Year Award was established in 1991 to recognize a prominent individual for steel industry leadership. This year's recipient is Leon Topalian, Chair, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Newcore Corporation. Leon, would you please join me at the podium?
The award reads, in recognition of his leadership of Nucor as one of the world's safest steel companies, his dedication to sustainable steel making, and his commitment to the American steel manufacturing. Under Topolian's leadership, Nucor has reached record profitability, taken a leadership role in the world's transition to 24-7 clean energy, while also achieving exemplary safety performance. He has overseen the strategic growth of Nucor's product capabilities and expansion into new markets, and has championed substantial investments in low-emission steel production. And as one of the strongest advocates for the passage of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act of 2021, Pauline has worked tirelessly to ensure steel will remain a kill building block for America's future. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to the AIST Executive Committee and to the AIST Awards and Recognitions Program Committee for this incredibly humbling honor. I'm very pleased to accept this award for Steelmaker of the Year on behalf of our more than 31,000 team members across 300 plus locations across the United States and all around the world. I have the incredible privilege every day to stand shoulder to shoulder with the greatest manufacturing army assembled anywhere in the world. My new core teammates, 30 of which are in the room tonight, can I, this morning, can I ask you to stand so I can thank you? Thank you. You see, our success begins with each of you, as our team is truly the value creators at Nucor. And for all of us in the room this morning, we stand on the shoulders of giants of the American steel industry, like Ken Iverson, founder of the modern day Nucor and pioneer of the electric arc furnace steel making, and recognized by AIST as the first ever steel maker of the year in 1991. Would have thought 32 years later, it's come full circle and I get to stand here and accept this award. And I'm incredibly proud of what our new core team has done in, in accomplishing, including back-to-back -back years of the safest, cleanest, and most profitable years in the history of our company. And our team has truly embraced our goal to become the world's safest steel company by delivering back-to-back-to-back-to-back record safety years and consistently operating at one-third of the injury and illness rate of the industry's average. In fact, 20 of our facility divisions have had zero recordable, recordable injuries in 2022, and we hope to add to that even more this year. Our team is also executing on our eight-word mission statement to grow the core, expand beyond, and live our culture. We are now two-thirds of the way through a $14 billion CapEx plan that's gonna double Nucor's earnings potential in the next three years from the pre-pandemic levels. Our Nucor Steel Brandenburg team delivered one of the safest mill startups in history as they brought our new plate mill online, on time and on budget, with one of the safest startups in Nucor's history ever. With the ability to serve everything from our growing offshore wind industry to the modern day advanced steel plate desperately needed by the United States military, we have several exciting greenfield projects and capital projects at existing steel mills that will give us the new capabilities to produce the next generation of low carbon steels required by our automotive partners and other customers. In last year alone, we welcomed more than 2,000 new team members as we delivered on the expand beyond part of our mission statement, moving into additional steel adjacent businesses. We have created four new growth programs, overhead doors, towers and structures, insulated metal panels, and warehouse systems. Each of those platforms are already benefiting our bottom line. And I'm not only excited about what we're doing at Nucor, but the opportunities for the entire industry. We've just come off two phenomenal years of American steelmakers with robust demand for our products across a range of end use markets. But what excites me most is so many things of our industry have advocated for over the lot of years are finally coming a reality. We have been leading a voice for years urging our government to enforce our trade laws more vigorously. We finally saw the fruits of our labor in 2015 with the Level the Playing Field Act supported by leaders on both political aisles. We have always said that given a level playing field, the men and women of the American steel industry can now compete anyone. And of course, 
we must remain vigilant about the enforcement of our trade laws and their steel product areas seeing an influx of unfairly traded imports, but the situation today is much better than it has been in the past. Our industry knows that manufacturing is the backbone of the American economy. We've been beating that drum for more than uh, many, many decades now because the investment is a pathway to high paying jobs for millions of Americans. And we're now seeing an American manufacturing renaissance as companies look to reshore their production. Federal investment of nearly $1 trillion in infrastructure, clean energy, and semiconductors will drive an additional five to eight million tons of steel demand per year for the next decade and change the face of American manufacturing. As the cleanest low emitting steel producers in the world, led by our electric arc furnace producers, we have an enormous competitive advantage over higher emitting dirty producers in Europe and Asia as more steel customers look for ways to reduce their carbon emissions in their supply chains. As leaders in sustainability, the American steel industry needs to engage globally as carbon regulations continue to be developed, including promotion of the world's most aggressive pro-climate standard for reducing emissions in the steel industry, as recently introduced by the Global Steel Climate Council. With greater than 70% of our steel making based being EAF based, we need to make sure regulatory programs recognize the emission reductions already achieved through the circular model of steel making. And unfortunately, irresponsible steel makers propose standards that will penalize and disadvantage low emission producers so they can emit at higher levels for longer and that then seek to dump those problems on our shores. We must remain vigilant in a world proposing these dirty standards and of a world of oversupply that continues to exploit every loophole and circumvent our laws. The issues of sustainability and circular steelmaking transcend competition. Climate change is an ex existential issue of our time for the entire globe, and American steelmakers must continue to lead toward a cleaner future, to lead with integrity, and to lead with transparency, and to advocate for policies and steelmaking processes that ensure our children and future generations will look back and be proud of the steelmaking's new world order built on the clean circular model of American steelmaking. I'm incredibly grateful to be part of Nucor and the American steel industry. I want to thank my wife, Kim, our four children, and our newest uh, addition to the family, uh, grandson, Baby Sullivan. And I'd also like to thank our teammates who continue to live our culture each and every day, driving, ensuring the most important value in our company, the health, safety, and well-being of our team and the 31,000 team members that call the Nucor family home each and every day. Continue to stay hungry, honest, humble, and thank you for this award. God bless. The final award presented this year is the William Hogan Memorial Lecture Award. This award was established in 1990 in memory of the late Reverend William Hogan, director of Fordham University's Industrial Economics Research Institute. A true in innovator in economic education, Reverend Hogan taught generations of students about industrial interdependence and the steel industry's vital role in economic development. Today's honorary lecturer shares Hogan's view of the importance of steel and has been selected in recognition of individual outstanding leadership to the iron and steel industry. I'm pleased to introduce the recipient of the 2023 William Hogan Memorial Lecture Award and our keynote speaker, John Brett. going on up here. I got to get situated and uh, I'm vertically challenged unlike Keith. So let me lower the just a little. Just a bit. So thanks Keith and good morning to everybody. Uh, some of you know that uh, I have trouble uh, sticking on a script. So we're not going to do that. I'll freelance a little bit. Uh, to scare everybody, I have a clicker in my hands. It's not a remote. 
window. You know what? I'll be okay because as always, he's here. If I get in trouble, he'll quickly fix all my technical problems like he always does. Wow, so far so good. Okay, first, a little bit of a commercial for ArcelorMittal. While you peruse some of these statistics, I'd like to talk about our four key values. The first is safety. We really, truly believe that every accident is avoidable. The second is sustainability. We want to thrive in tomorrow's world. The world is constantly evolving. So we need to understand not only economic and market perspectives, but also social and environmental megatrends. Third is quality. We strive to exceed expectations in our products, in our processes, and our performance. The fourth and most important is leadership. We challenge the status quo in everything we do. Most importantly, we refuse to accept that the limits of our material have been reached. I'm not going to reiterate any of the stats that are on the slide, but I, I do want to mention a few uh, that aren't on the slide and a lot of people don't know uh, so much about ArcelorMittal in North America. So in 2022, our revenues were $14 billion. We sold in excess of 10 million metric tons, and we generated $3.1 billion of EBITDA. Uh-oh, Keith. I got it. I told you I'd have problems. Uh, there's only a few things I want to talk here about here. The first is health and safety. We are really proud of what we've accomplished in North America over the last two years. We've improved our LTI rate, lost time injuries, by nearly 50%. It should be noted at ArcelorMittal, we measure this on the basis of 1 million hours. So when you hear our rates, you need to divide by five to put it on a comparable basis. Last year, our LTI rate was 0.24, and in the first quarter this year, knock on wood, 0.08. We only had one LTI. So Keith, we're getting close. Our journey to zero is attainable. I know it, you know it. Now, I've had a few successes in my career, a lot more failures, and uh, certainly one thing that I have really failed and that is attracting women into the steel industry. Tried, but I've been successful. I'm going to keep trying. You know, we have to improve. We must improve. We are missing out on 50% of the talent in the world. That's unacceptable. So you can see we're targeting to increase the percentage of women who are in our leadership positions. It's something that I'm committed, I'm going to be successful before I retire. It's going to happen, I feel it. It's so nice, I met some young ladies last night, it's great. Welcome aboard. Please bring anybody and everybody. We need, we need it. R&D, we think that's a key differentiator. We have over 1,200 scientists across our labs. You can see some of their accomplishments in 22, the programs they've undertaken, the inventions they've created, and the products they've developed. Turning to decarbonization, the vast majority, the last number that I saw at least, was 70% of the global economy has established a net zero target. But the reality is, concrete plans to deliver those commitments are still in their infancy. Why is this? First, it's the staggering cost. Second, it's technical readiness, particularly at commercial scale for the evolving technologies we need to support it. Sure, 
Increasing scrap is going to reduce our CO2 emissions, but its availability is limited. Sufficient quantities of scrap to meet society's replacement steel needs will not be available for decades. Therefore, primary steel making is going to be around for 50 years. So to reach our ambitions, our net zero ambitions, we have to figure out how to decarbonize primary steel making. I have to admit that uh, this title I stole from Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it is certainly true. You know, there's multiple ways to make steel. So it should follow that there are multiple paths to decarbonize it. That's the approach we're taking at ArcelorMittal. Whenever I face an opportunity or a challenge, I like to put things in perspective. So what I like to do is outline our context for decarbonization at ArcelorMittal. First, the steel, indu steel industry is responsible for 7 to 9% of CO2 emissions. This is global. 7 to 9%. The cost of the transition. I just mentioned it. It's staggering. I've seen an estimate as high as a trillion dollars to transition global steel production to net zero and multiples of that amount for the clean energy required to support it. Today, Scrap comprises about 20 to 22 percent of global metallic inputs. The IEA estimates by 2037, I'm sorry, 2030, 37 percent of steel will be produced EA by EAFs. That's going to grow to actually 50 percent by 2050. Here in the United States, Recent installations and future announcements account for another 16 million tons of capacity. You know what? It's all EAF based, and 85% of it is flat rolled. What's this mean? It means we need another 10 to 12 million tons of prime scrap or ore based metallics whether it be pig iron, DRI, HBI. And oftentimes I hear that we're in great shape in the United States. You know what we'll do? We'll just stop exporting scrap. It's true. We do indeed export a lot of scrap, somewhere between 15 and 20 million tons. It's all obsolete. We actually import 2 million tons of prime scrap. And prime scrap generation, it's abating. 50 years ago, every year in this country, we generated 40 million gross tons of prime scrap. Today, that's about 15 million. Just last week, I read something very, very interesting. By 2032, 2032, DRI capacity throughout the world will actually exceed DR pellets by 19 million tons. So we're going to have a scarcity there. One last thing, whether it's surface quality requirements, formability, or some other characteristics, a significant portion of demand requires ore-based metallics. So this is, the, this is our context at ArcelorMittal. This is certainly an eye chart. So I don't expect you to read it, and God knows I couldn't explain it. So I'll just make a few comments. I'm, te I'm teasing, obviously. So. As I said, uh, we have a couple of pathways to decarbonize at ArcelorMittal. 
The first one we call smart carbon. And so the path to carbon neutrality for blast furnace technology is through the increased use of clean fuels, including hydrogen, the increased use of circular carbon, including sustainable biomass and end of life plastics, increased use of capturing carbon, use it, store it. What we're trying to do is convert waste gas to recyclable products. The scale of our company really affords us the opportunity to deploy pilot programs throughout the world. So I'd like to share a few of those with you. The first, and this is at our Gen plant in Belgium, it's called Toro. And what we're doing is we're actually converting waste wood and in a life plastics to bio coal. We spent 55 million euros on this plant, it's industrial scale, and it's producing 40,000 tons of bio coal a year. Also, at our plant, same plant, Ghent in Belgium, we have a joint development with Lancetec. This process is using gas fermentation to take waste gas and make bioethanol. This investment was about 200 million euros. It's operational as I speak, and it's going to produce 80 million liters of bioethanol a year. Last thing I want to mention is actually at our plant in France, Dunkirk. There, we're deploying what we call IGAR. We're going to capture the carbon monoxide and actually re-inject it into the furnace as a reductant. We think that we'll reduce our CO2 emissions by about 20%. The second pathway we call innovative DRI EAF. Of course, these technologies have been around for a long time. What's different is soon there should be affordable industrial scale hydrogen. There's already cost effective storage. So net zero is attainable in the very, very near future under this pathway. We'll talk more about this in a bit because it's the pathway of choice for our North American operations. But I would like to highlight two recent initiatives. First, we have successfully used green hydrogen at our plant in Quebec. This is a really important step for us. In Conchacur, our DR capacity is 1.7 million tons. But more importantly, 99% of Quebec's energy is renewable. So we're very, very excited of the prospects there. We're also testing hydrogen in Hamburg, one of our plants in Germany. By 2025, we hope to have reached commercial maturity and produce 100,000 tons of DRI via hydrogen. Given the scale and breadth of the decarbonization challenge, technological innovation is a critical enabler. This is the impetus behind our XCARB fund. We are investing $500 million to fund those who are developing technologies to support the decarbonization of steel. To date, we've already committed $280 million. You can see some of the companies we've committed they include renewable energy, uh, nuclear technology, molten oxide electrolysis, hydrogen electrolysis. Uh, breakthrough energy is interesting. It focuses in four areas, direct carbon capture, green hydrogen, energy storage, and actually sustainable aviation fuels.
So what are we doing in North America? Investments that have already been initiated and a recent acquisition are going to significantly alter our North American carbon footprint, drastically reducing our CO2 emissions. Right now, we're in the midst of our 1.5 million EAF construction at our joint venture, AMNS Calvert, located in Alabama. This production stream is going to replace slabs which were previously produced by higher emitting blast furnace. Our construction has contemplated the optionality of doubling capacity. And we're studying this as we speak. Once we accomplish this, we'll have 4.5 million tons of EAF-based slabs largely supplied via DRI HBI. In the middle of 2022, we acquired an 80% stake in a world-class HBI facility located in Corpus Christi, Texas. The current capacity of that plant is 2 million tons, and it is located on its own deep water port. There's unused land there, so we're thinking about expanding. If we do, that will be 100% owned by ArcelorMittal. This is a very, very important investment for us because it gives us really a security supply for the ore base metallics that we need to produce our high quality demanding product mix at Calvert. It's also gonna lower our emissions by about 50%. The production tax credits, which are contained in the Inflation Reduction Act, really provide a viable pathway to address the remaining CO2 emissions. First, they can be captured and stored. Second, they can be eliminated by actually replacing the natural gas with hydrogen. Texas is very well situated for either one of these pathways. The geology, it works. There's already an infrastructure of pipes. Ample sun and wind. So renewables will work. So we're very, very, very excited about our prospects there. Last year, we also made an announcement about our mines in Canada. We're going to convert all 10 million tons of our production of pellets to DR pellets. This is going to reduce CO2 by about 200,000 tons. It's about 20% of what the plant generates. But more importantly, it secures a vital feedstock for our HBI plant in Texas and our DRI plants in Canada, which brings me to our next investment. We're investing in a mega module DRI installation and a 2.4 million ton EAF at our plant in Hamilton, Ontario. Once we implement this investment, we will actually reduce our CO2 by 3 million tons while still being able to supply our automotive and packaging customers. When we made this announcement, we actually said it'd be operational by the end of 2028. Ron, I know you're out there somewhere. I'm looking for 27, so let's, let's make that happen. To uh, round out our flat wheel operations in North America, I'll just briefly talk about uh, our operations in Mexico. So in 2021, late in the year, uh, almost Christmas time, uh, we actually rolled our first coil and our 2.5 million ton hot strip mill. As you can see, we have 3.8 million tons of EAF slab making capability at this facility, supported by 4.5 million tons of DRI. The slabs that aren't required at the hot strip mill actually support our JV in Alabama. So we're very, very excited about our future depending how Ron does here. 
but I'll give a little, little, bit of, little bit of slack. Let's say in the next five years, our entire flat roll product mix will be a EAF based, sourced predominantly by DRI or HBI. So what's next? You know, Leon and I have been in Washington many times together. One thing we always say is we're not afraid of competition. We both mean it. We're always going to compete. Competition's good. It improves our quality of life. But how about we start collectively promoting steel as the material choice for solving the climate challenge? It has so many positive attributes. Infinitely recyclable. 85 to 95 percent of steel is remelted into new steel products. No other material is so circular. Aluminum. Okay, 76 percent. Not bad. It has segregation issues. Plastics. Eight percent. Cement. Concrete, zero. We look at the, the carbon footprint for steel. It's better than other materials. Again, plastics, carbon fibers. Every ton you produce that material, four tons of CO2. Concrete, 0.8. The other thing that's great about steel it is a critical enabler for decarbonizing other industries. Think about all the steel that's needed for wind towers, for electricity transmission, solar farms, a hydrogen network. You know, we talk a lot about automotive, and for good reason. Steel, it's the optimal combination of strength light weighting, and it's cost effective. Right? We need safe, affordable cars. One thing we don't talk enough about is construction. You know, 40% of the world's CO2 comes from building and construction. Life cycle analysis has demonstrated steel's superiority compared to other materials. Again, cement, concrete. We need to talk about this much more. Policy is going to be very important. We're very fortunate. The US and Canadian governments, they're providing assistance to support this tremendous cost of decarbonization. The other thing they're starting to do is delve into policies as far as really determining what constitutes low carbon steel. I think we should engage in those discussions and provide guidance. Standards are required. They'll give us transparency and consistency for the benefit of our customers. And I think they're going to be a necessity because I think one day decarbonization will migrate to trade. So we have to have a level, a level playing field there. I don't know what form it could take. It could be the global arrangement on sustainable steel. It could be a CBAM or another vehicle but we have to have standards there. Based on our belief that primary steelmaking is going to be around for decades, 
we think the standards should incentivize decarbonization of, of all methods of steel making through technological shifts. We also think the standards should clearly define the boundaries for how CO2 is going to be counted and establish LCAs for finished products. Based on these tenets, we introduced a concept paper which promotes a sliding scale based on the percentage of scrap used. You know, I just heard Leon, and Leon and I are good friends, and we'll talk and we'll debate, so we haven't reached a meeting of the minds. But we'll find common ground, and we need to. From my vantage point, when it comes to other materials, we're in a standards race. Some of you maybe are too young to remember, there was a standards race between VHS and Beta. It was close for a while, then Beta disappeared. So we need to keep talking, right? We need to win the standards race as far as competing materials go. Last slide, I promise. So my daughter's going to graduate uh, from college. And so out of deference for her, I'm going to quote one of her heroes, or at least the namesake of one of her favorite places to visit on Earth, Walt Disney. The best way to begin is to stop talking and start doing. As the leading global steel and mining company, we recognize we have to play a primary role in decarbonizing the industry. But we realize we need cooperation. We really, really hope you will join us in this quest. I thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening or this morning. Um, before we close, I would like to congratulate uh, all the award recipients and acknowledge the following groups that have made AIS Tech 2023 possible. The Conference Planning Committee, chaired by Chad Cathcart from Stelco, Superbooth and the Systems Group for their global event sponsorship, the Systems Group for their added support uh, with this morning's program, the 29 technology committees for compiling an excellent technical program, the 588 exhibiting companies for their support of our exposition. The Huntington Place and of course our tremendous AIST staff, let's please give them all a final round of applause. This concludes our program. Thank you all for attending. Have a great day. Thank you.